as far as uh, your interest in UFOs, when did it all start? And what prompted it, really? Well, I really didn't have much interest in flying saucers. I was working as a nuclear physicist on nuclear airplanes back for General Electric in Cincinnati in <clears throat> 1958. And uh, was ordering books from New York and needed one more book so I wouldn't pay shipping costs. And there was one <laughs> on flying saucers. I figured it was worth a right. laugh. Yeah. And the book happened to be a very lucky first book. It was by the man who had headed the U.S. Air Force Project Blue Book in the early 50s, mm -hmm. one of the few good guys on the program. And it stimulated me. It certainly didn't convince me. It convinced a neighbor of mine, an engineer about 10 years older than I was, and I respected him, and decided I'd better read a lot more before I reached a conclusion one way or another. So I read another 15 or 20 books, talked about it with my colleagues at lunchtime. And it took a couple of years. I was confused, frankly. And then two things happened that sort of pushed me off the fence. One was finding a document that none of the other books had mentioned, Project Blue Book Special Report 14. I have a copy here. Uh, it had all kinds of data that astonished me about the largest study ever done of flying saucers for the Air Force. Uh, it isn't mentioned in the seven skeptical books that have been written either, right. incidentally. Uh, that plus a certain case that happened in Utah in 1961, a pilot getting ready to take off on these beautiful crystal clear days 30-mile visibility, small plane, Waldo Harris, just about noontime. And he sees a glint from something in the sky. He thinks, well, it's probably an airplane, doesn't worry about it. You're always looking around before you take off. Yeah, right. And he taxis out, and after some time, he finally gets off in a loft and still there. Well, it couldn't have been an airplane. It took him several minutes to go through this routine. So he heads toward it, uh, meanwhile radioing the ground. He sees it in front of the mountain. He's on the same altitude it is, and it's sitting there just tilting back and forth. The disc a little bigger than his Mooney aircraft, maybe 40, 50 feet in diameter, 10, 15 feet thick. He can see the skin. I mean, it's, it's metal. Six guys on the ground, all pilots, are watching as he approaches this disc. It goes straight up about 1,000 feet. Now, they knew what altitude he was at, so they could estimate the 1,000 pretty good. Just pops. You know, no visible acceleration or deceleration. Stops dead. Now he tilts the plane, goes up after it still, sits there for a bit, moves off over, rapidly over an omni station, radio direction uh, place, beacon, and then takes off. Total time about nine minutes for all this. And I talked to Mr. Harris. Because I was project engineer on an Air Force contract out of the same base, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and now the same place that for, uh, Project Blue Book was, Air Technical Intelligence Center, uh, I got access to the official Air Force interrogation of all these witnesses. And I also talked to Mr. Harris. Now, the explanation that came out later, it was a sun dog, a mock sun produced by a refraction of ice crystals. No way in the world looking at the original file. And the Air Force did a good investigation, lousy explanation. <laughs> well, that case, plus this, these other data, sort of pushed me off the fence. I'm a little slow. Talked to a lot of people. 1967, I gave my first lecture in somebody's living room, 20 people. Uh, by 1970, I was tired of working on canceled government-sponsored research and development programs, <laughs> and I decided to go full-time on the UFO scene, and since that time I've lectured now at something over 500 colleges and six provinces and 48 states. Have you yourself ever seen one? Never seen one. You've never had That bothers some people. They say, how can you talk about something you've never seen? Look, I spent 14 years chasing neutrons and gamma rays. I never saw a neutron or a gamma ray. They're real, too. Okay, what do I expect to find? I guess if the ultimate stuff were released, I think what we'd find would be analysis of both crashed saucers and captured bodies. In other words, physical evidence. Oh yeah, no question about it. This, that, is, this is where this book came in on the Roswell incident. I was a research consultant to Bill Moore, one of the co-authors. And Bill and I, between us, talked to more than 60 people involved in this case. This is 1947, right after the big noise about UFOs began. There were sightings all over North America, Canada and the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently one ran into a lightning storm in New Mexico and they've got some doozies. I've been down there, hailstones is big, spectacular. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of it b broke up. Pieces were scattered all over a field. Uh, they were picked up by a rancher. He talks to the sheriff. The sheriff calls a local, Air the Roswell Army Air Force Base. Uh, Major Jesse Marcel goes out there. I've talked to Major Marcel. He's alive and well. Uh, went out there. He went out with a counterintelligence corps man. They picked up a Buick full and an Army carry-all full. They brought it back. About 100 miles west of this place, which is way out in the boonies. Roswell is a town, but and I've been there. But this is 40 miles outside Roswell. You've got to go cross-country. Mm -hmm. It's ranching territory, dry desert ranching kind of place. West of Socorro, New Mexico, which is about 100 miles from where this took place, 
A man named Barney Barnett, an engineer in the state of New Mexico, we've talked to half a dozen people who knew him, and everybody says if Barney said it, it was true. You know, the West was the West then. <laughs> this is not New York City. Uh, Barney saw something on the ground. He thought it was a crashed airplane. And he also fired rockets around there once in a while. So he goes over there, and uh, there's a saucer. A saucer? Well, uh, not a little it, one. I mean a 30-foot yeah. diameter thing dug into the ground. A UFO ship. Uh, yeah, right? crashed saucer. Vehicle, yeah. yeah, with bodies strewn around it. And the military is there. They tell them to go away. There's another group of people, archaeological group, who I'm trying to locate. So I think we're dealing with intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. And I don't mean all UFO sightings represent that. Of course not. Most don't. Most are explainable. Well, most people aren't seven feet tall either. The coach says, give me the guy who is. I don't care right. about the guys who aren't. <laughs> so from a government viewpoint, you want to figure out how these things work. The first thought in 47 was that they were Russian. I've talked to the family of one of the, the base commander at Roswell. And first thought with these strange symbols and everything, and with the Cold War being what it was, they must be Russian. And if they were, we had a problem. They were perfectly legitimate in covering that up, as long as they thought they were Russian, because they better find out you know, what makes these things tick. Because if these guys are going thousands of miles an hour and we haven't yet gone supersonic. So the evidence of, of, that, that's available at the moment then says that this is not an earthly thing. No. I'm sure that we're trying to duplicate the behavior. Right, but we know that, but what you're saying yeah. is that the evidence is that there's We're not, dealing not with nerve, extraterrestrials. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Very straightforward. If, it seems to me though, I, I realize that even with the military aspect of it, the, a North American cover-up to that degree over so long, even now with our Freedom of Information Act, surely to God it's... Well, good. remember, stuff that affects national security is excluded from, uh, from freedom the Freedom of, of Information, information. Act. Information, yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of people find it difficult to believe that secrets have been kept that long. I spent 14 years working on classified programs, all of them. Um, atomic energy stuff is sort mm. of by its nature classified. And I've talked with a lot of people who've had top secret clearances and above, and there are categories above. And the people who've had the clearances don't find it difficult to believe at all. The people who've never had a clearance, some newsmen I've dealt with, you know, their attitude is, well, if such a thing was true, we would know about it. I mean, the aliens would have called a press conference. Well, and, all right, let, let's, let's, get, let, let's get into that for, for just a moment, because obviously for a layman, that is an obvious question, you know. If this thing, first of all, what are they doing? What are the aliens doing? Yeah. Well, do you well if we look at the reports from around the world, the reports from the abducted people, from the people who see them out in the field mm -hmm. kind of thing, they seem to be doing a survey, if you will, of the... I call it the geology, the rocks, the ground, the people, the animals of the planet. Uh, they do seem to monitor military things, but I think that makes sense. I mean, rule number one for aliens has got to be make sure you can get home. You don't want to wind up in the local zoo or stew or jail or morgue, and obviously the, it's a fairly hostile place. As soon as you come into the airspace, you get radar lock-ons, airplanes chasing you. You know, not a pleasant place. It looks to me as if what we're dealing with is sort of a galactic federation intelligence agency to put a name to it. There's one thing happening here that's guaranteed to be of interest to anybody from someplace else in advanced civilization. Namely that soon, less than a hundred years, which is nothing on a cosmic time scale, we earthlings will be going to the stars. And I think the cop on the beat said, holy cow, these, this primitive society whose major activity is quite obviously tribal warfare and certainly the news right. stories this week or any other week will mm -hmm. confirm that, uh, is going to be bothering us.